Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming. My name is Hollow, and today, of course, we're talking more stories too. I've got lots of great information for you in this video, all things that many players, it would seem, aren't aware of. These are lesser known details that are either strange and interesting or incredibly important and quite useful. So I hope you enjoy and get use out of my 10 things you didn't know you could do in stories too. Let's begin with a fun one then, and also really useful. When you're stealing eggs from a nest, you might end up waking the sleeping monster or even spawn one in when that nest was empty. Pretty annoying when you're avoiding a fight and there's no way to really escape with that egg of yours. Fortunately, there's two ways you can avoid the fight and get out without dealing with the monster. Firstly, and honestly, the main way is through online co-op. When the monster is about to collide with you, you can simply open the menu. During that, you basically don't exist in the game and the monster can't engage with you. So just pull up the menu as it's about to collide with you. And then when it's passed by, come out of the menu and just run out of there. This is a lot easier to do when you've got a friend letting you know when to move and when to stay in the menu like I did. He's attacking you. Okay, and tell me when. Right, go. You should Oh, that's so front. sick, dude. That's so sick. That's Come so in. sick. Okay, okay. Uh... <laughs> We're good. Oh, stopped, stopped. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> okay, am I good? Am I good? Tell me when. Uh, you just stay in it for now. Okay. He's still, he's just literally stood in front of you. Try it now, go. Oh, I'm out. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Alternatively though, there is another way. You could pick up another egg just as that monster is about to attack you, about to collide with you for similar iframes. But this is only a one and done kind of trick, obviously more restricted, but that's also an option to use while offline and solo. Moving on then, this next one is a random detail that I just really enjoy, super modes for monsties. Many monsters will enter a sort of super state during their kinship ability. A good example of this would be Rajang. He'll enter a yellow sort of super saiyan state that we know from the main series as when he's enraged. Here though, he only uses that mode when in his kinship, where we actually see it. It's awesome for that brief moment that he's in his yellow lightning glory state, but after the kinship ends, he's sadly back to normal. Well, as it turns out, there is a way to get your monster to look like it's super state during regular combat through the use of element clad genes. So each of the elements come with a clad version of it. So you could have fire clad, thunder clad, ice clad, and so on. Let's use Velcana for example. To say we use a ice clad gene during combat, she would then be wearing her awesome ice armor. So in the case of Rajang here, who I want to go Super Saiyan in my fights more often, to do that, I just needed to grab the Thunderclad gene from Zinoga or whoever else has it, maybe Toby or whatever, and then have Rajang use that ability in combat. Sometimes he'll choose to do it himself, maybe you can manually have him do it, but for three more turns, he will be in his super mode and do extra damage with Thunder as well. So that's actually pretty relevant mechanically and visually awesome. Kind of a fun thing to be able to do. There's Rajang, obviously, there's Velcano with the ice armor, but who else has like a super mode that you could do this with? If you have ideas, let me know. But moving on, here's just a weird one. You can ditch and swap around your battle companions, right? As you probably know. These guys stay in their logical home hub, each of their different villages. They're easy to go find, chat to, and then bring on in your adventures. If you want to lose them or swap them, you can just talk to them while waiting near the main exit of whatever village you're currently in. But did you notice that Enna is always standing right next to them too? Well, for some cursed reason, you can talk to Enna and remove her from your party as well, so that she's not riding around on the monsters with you, and in general, greatly improving your life by existing in it. I don't know why you would do this. I don't know what kind of monster would want to kick Enna from the party, but that's not me for sure. But it is a thing you can do, so there you go. Next up then, this is a cool detail. Kinships are great, right? There's a lot of them. But as it turns out, there might actually be more than you first realized. You see, there are some special, unique, and much lesser known duo kinships that you can do during co-op. Some monsters have special duo kinships that can only play out when done with their right duo monster. You'll see generic ones like this one, where two monsters are running together and then they collide into one attacking force. But have you seen this one, where these two Aptonoff are running together and then start spinning like Beyblades in a joint circle attack? It looks ridiculous and awesome. As it turns out, there's actually a bunch of these that people are just discovering, and we're currently testing them all for a video. There appears to be different categories of the duo attacks triggered by different things, but more info and a video on that coming soon. All right, moving on. Here's one that Josh thinks people have missed. 
Even someone I know didn't realize the second half of this. So layered armor and armor customization. In this game, you can layer your real gear to look like another and also customize it with new colors and even glows if it's got that. And this can all be done for very little cost. So if you missed it, you just need to head to Lulucion, which has the layered armor blacksmith down on the right. And this guy will craft your layered armor out of sets that you actually already own. So to make more, you need to visit a regular blacksmith and have him craft the set that you want to wear. My tip for this is to try having craft a low rank set of that monster if you can. I know you can't do all the Elder Dragons, for example, but if you can do it with a lower rank monster, the mats are going to be way cheaper and less relevant to your end game needs. Either way, once you've got your armor set of choice crafted, take it to the layered blacksmith for a cheap craft, and from there, it will now be a permanent layered set you can use and customize. Just head to your home in any of the hubs and use the chest. Select appearance, and you'll see the customization and layered options. We can pick our layered sets from the list we've unlocked so far, and then go on to customize those colors in pretty impactful ways. The downside here is the lack of color options. In the main series, we can choose the perfect color of all color types, but not color the parts we want in many cases. Meanwhile, in stories, we we can color the armor in way greater detail, but we have less colors to work with. Why is nothing ever perfect? But there you have it, layered armor, customization, and how it works if you have somehow missed that. Next up then, I need to talk about expeditions because my god, you need to be thinking about these. They're extremely important and very strong. The short version of this is that all those extra monsters that you have lying around in your stables actually can serve a purpose. Send them out on missions of varying length and difficulty in return for items and XP. This can be a great way to level your monsters en masse without taking them out into the fight directly. More likely though, you want to use them to get super important items like charms, nutriments, and most of all, armor and weapon spheres. If you're not doing this right now at endgame, you're doing it wrong. So through the Melinx Inc. upgrades, you can actually get yourself six expedition slots by trading bottle caps for that upgrade. However many expedition slots you currently have though, make use of them. We can select where to send the monsties, and the lower down on this list, the harder the mission will be. That will also change what rewards you get, so you might want to actively choose a variety, depending on what you want. The part you send out will just need to match the recommended elements. By matching these, you'll grow greatly increase the odds of success. So if it's asking for water and thunder creatures, just put in a bunch of water and thunder creatures and you'll likely succeed. Try to avoid sending that party out if it's below 70% chance of success. You know, that, that could be a huge waste of time. These could take hours at certain points. But with that sorted, just make sure to choose what kind of mission you're sending them on via the mission instructions. Basically, I would have you choose between the XP or the treasure ones, but at endgame, I would assume 90% of the time, you want to be maximizing these expeditions by using Treasure Hunter. I've got so many charms, nutriments, spheres, and more by just doing this passively. So I'm doing it constantly. I really recommend you get these set up the next time you play, do not miss out. All right, next is a really, really important one for endgame players the Melinx Inc. vendor and his new tab of items that you can use. When you reach post-story content, the endgame, you'll have fully upgraded your Melinx Inc. options, and with that, you'll be able to trade for more items with bottle caps. As you probably know, there's this first tab, which shows lots of good items, stable or expedition upgrades, but there's now a second tab you might have missed, which you swap to, and now you can see things like expedition tickets to go hunt specific monsters. Importantly, the super rare ones for the 100 bottle caps. This lets you go hunt elders, deviants and get an absolute truck ton of platinum gened eggs. There's also the new Palamute tickets to go get some great genes from those. There's nutriments here to buy, which will permanently increase the stats of a monstie. And stimulants, which will unlock gene slots for better right of channeling. So yeah, very important. You can't miss these. Maybe you didn't, but maybe you've missed the new tab with the talisman trades. The second tab here lets you trade 30 bottle caps for a random talisman, a somewhat RNG endgame build system that we can work with for our own character. Through great talismans, we can then choose which armor set to wear with what weapon, what build overall. This is going to be how you likely get your ideal talisman. So once again, don't miss it. All right, so let's talk some specific details to help you out even further with the prayer pot. Of course, you can find these near the exit of any village and we know that it serves three purposes. Prayers, charms, and the Lunar Luck daily roll. The daily roll is RNG roll for an item, but more importantly, we have the prayers and the charms. The prayers let us go out on an adventure with a buff, while the charms provide us with similar buffs at the cost of the charm itself. This is on a timer, so that lasts a lot longer, and we can extend it even more by adding more charms into it. We probably know all that. Here's the extra details. Apparently, charms and prayers of the same type 
won't stack. So there's no point in putting on finding charms and finding prayers at the same time. The stronger one will just take the effect. The prayers are unlocked through leveling the pot, which can go all the way to level 20, but it will actually only unlock new prayers to try uh, level 8 and below. It's still worth leveling though, since it does boost the effect of all prayers the higher level it is. To level it, you just need to use charms, which of course can be obtained in chests, expeditions, quests, or even the lunar look. And we can level it really quick by just using loads of charms at once, so very worth doing. Ideally though, meta endgame is to be running finding charms or maybe the finding prayer at any and all times you're gathering eggs for genes, which is basically always. It greatly increases the chance that you'll get better genes to power up with your squad, since you're going to be getting rarer eggs more often. Try to get the pot to level 20 ASAP because the prayers will be most effective at that point, and that will set you back a whopping 170 charms total, but thankfully there are charms that you almost never use that you can use to spend on that. Keep in mind though that charms are more effective than prayers, and that makes sense since they're more limited. Next up then, number 9, passive genes and their lack of stacking. A mistake I was apparently making making until Josh let me know was how I was trying to stack genes to get better effects. If you're unaware, you'll find lots of genes of the same type that do the same thing but at different effect levels. So that's like a gene that's in small, medium, large or extra large effect range, the extra large being the most effective. So if you were to say put the same gene in your different slots and have four types of that gene, one of each level, only the highest level will actually take effect. So let's look at the case of my Naga Kuga here. I've got critical eye genes. One is small, one is medium, and unfortunately, only the medium is actually doing anything. That's pretty unfortunate because it can be pretty hard to get the bingo effects without doing this type of thing initially while you're going through the story or whatever. But it still might be worth doing at first since, yeah, it does trigger the bingo. So maybe you simply don't have the ideal perks right now and you can make use of passives of the same type to trigger a bingo still. Well then go for it. If you don't have a better option, that's still good, right? You can just replace that slot later. Still, it's good to know about this for long term for building an ideal monster, knowing that those genes won't stack. And finally, nutriments, which are incredibly strong and important. You probably know about them already. These are the permanent buffs for your party that come in three forms. Vitality, strength, and defense. Vitality applied to a monster permanently increases its health pool. Strength increases the element attack power. And defense increases the element defense. Very powerful, and you can use 10 of each type on every monster. So ideally you want to reach that limit of each type of nutriment on every monster you have. But did you know that you can actually use these nutriments on yourself? I had no idea, and that's really important. Maybe you all know this and I'm just dumb on this one, but I genuinely thought it was just for monsties, so maybe someone out there is like me and didn't know. There's a good chance that you're not sure which monsties you're going to keep around for your main team while you're going through the story, but you can be damn sure you are going to be in your own party, so buff yourself ASAP. There's no reason to hold on to these when you can use them on yourself still. But there you have it. 10 interesting and useful things that you can do in stories too that you might not have known about. If this was useful or entertaining, please do drop a like on the video to let me know that I should make more videos like this for stories. It was fun to make and I used to do these for Rise. Maybe you even have a suggestion for the next video. Let me know in the comments. Until next time then, I've been Hollow, you've been you. Thanks for watching. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye